case you didn't pick up on it, open your Bibles to 2 Peter. Hope that was big and bold enough for you. <clears throat> but as usual, it's going to be a minute before I get to the text, but it won't be long. Still want to till that intellectual ground for you uh, so we can be thinking before we get to 2 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> I know I've mentioned this before, but my backyard and its wildlife and its things that grow there are just a great source of illustration for me. I have five fruit trees in my backyard. Two pear, one peach, one cherry, and one apple. They are different ages, sizes, locations, and of course they bear different fruit. One pear tree is very close to the house. My wife and I can sit there and it's next to the window, and we can sit there, and in spring we watch the, it blossom. And then we see the pears grow little by little, and by um, late summer, we have a pear tree full of big, beautiful pears. We enjoy watching that, and it's right there outside our window. The cherry tree is the largest and produces the most fruit. It produces fruit that everybody likes. Everybody likes cherries. But it's the furthest from the house where we cannot appreciate it very much. The other three are in the back of the yard, close to one another, where conditions are not best. So although they all bear some good fruit, much is wasted. The peach tree is the smallest and bears the least fruit, but it's beautiful, edible, and appetizing, even for me, because I don't like peaches. One day, as I mowed the lawn, I got to wondering which fruit tree thought it was the most important. Those are the things I think about when I mow the lawn. Are they jealous of one another? Are they critical of one another? Are they unhappy with their conditions? Are they unhappy with their placement in the yard? Did they wish they were the huge maple tree out front who will never bear any fruit but is big and strong noticed and admired by all who pass by. What were the fruit trees thinking? So I ask them. The cherry tree felt underappreciated because he produced lots of what everybody wanted, but he didn't get the attention he felt he deserved because he was out of sight. The apple tree complained about his condition, said he could do more if things were different. He said he was the oldest and can't do much anymore. The smaller pear tree way back in the corner said, I'm too small and weak. I'm not satisfied with my fruit. I'm not like your favorite. The pear tree who gets to be up close to the house, who gets all your attention, we all know you like him best. And as that tree said that to me, I looked at the other pear tree and he was smiling with prideful arrogance, knowing that that little pear tree was right. Finally, I got to the peach tree. I said, are you jealous of the others? Are you critical of them? Are you unhappy with your condition? Are you unhappy with your placement in the yard? Do you wish you were the mighty maple tree with a place of prominence and no expectations? I was surprised by his answer not because I was talking to the tree. <clears throat> His answer was simple. No, Bill, none of that's true. You see, Bill, I'm a peach tree. No more, no less. God created me to do one thing, grow peaches. What a privilege. I'm not to grow cherries or apples or pears. I wouldn't be good at it. If I tried, I'd fail. I have no time to be critical of the others. That won't help me be a better peach tree. I have no time to be jealous. That won't help me be a better peach tree. I have no time to complain. That won't help. Since the moment I realized I could grow peaches, it's all I've wanted to do. I get better at every year doing what God designed me to do. Who am I to be critical of God's marvelous design and specific purpose for me? 
If you ask 100 people on the street, what is a fruitful life? <clears throat> the answers would involve money, success, prosperity, maybe children or being happy, maybe even being a good person or helping others. As Christ followers, we are wise or would be wise to start with what God calls fruit and how we labor for it. It's imperative that we change our value system to match God's so that our passion is to labor and bear fruit, the fruit that he desires. Scripture makes over 300 references to fruit or fruitfulness, and the fundamental meaning of all of these is that one healthy living organism produces more than what it is itself. Fruit trees are designed and gifted to bear one kind of fruit. Once redeemed, you and I are granted holiness. God commands us to be godly and directs us to bear fruit, fruit that is holy, godlike, fruit that you would expect from a holy child of God. Any other fruit is destined to rot. God designed the genome of each fruit tree to bear a specific, a specific fruit. It is complex and specific, specific to each fruit. With perfect and unmanageable complexity, God designed you and I for a purpose. Unique and marvelous. Multiple disciplines come together in us so that we can be useful fruit bearers. In this series, we have spoken of these disciplines. Redemption, faith, prayer, holiness, purity, and perseverance. And today, these components come together for a fruitful life. I hope you're not sorry if you expected for me to present the mechanics of prosperity. We'll leave that to the prosperity theologians, and please leave them. I'm sorry if you expected me to give you the mechanics of a problem and worry-free life where only good things happen. That may be the worldview of a fruitful life. But frankly, we don't care what the worldview is. We need to know what God wants out of us to be useful and fruitful. truly redeemed are called to a far nobler, far more glorious, far more rewarding and challenging task than what the world would say is a fruitful life. To be useful and fruitful for Christ. How do these six components come together for a fruitful life? Now, open 2 Peter. See, I told you it would be fast. Aren't you impressed? 2 Peter. <clears throat> In the video that we showed, I, I, uh, when I kind of stumbled across that, I was probably two-thirds of the way through preparing for this sermon. I saw it and I said, this is a perfect example, and we're going to see it again at, at the end because I want to kind of put the bookends around this. The way the video showed this progression, this ladder of progression, is how Peter presents these components, these dynamics that lead to a useful and fruitful life. One fits inside the other. One points you towards the next. It's a progression. And it's important that we understand this progression because it's not one and then we're done with it and go to two and then we're done with it, we go to three. We, we build on them. We need a foundation. And then we build on that, and that develops something else, and that develops something else, leading up to godliness. 2 Peter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, 
apostle and servant of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter is talking to a specific group of people, born-again Christ followers. He's challenging them. He's getting their attention. He names his own authority as an apostle, but also as a servant. And he says, this is Peter, and I'm talking to you, those that are truly redeemed. You've obtained the righteousness, not of your own, but of our God and Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Faith has saved you so that you will practice moral excellence. As we build on these one by one, we want to make sure that uh, we recognize that, that there is this, when I get to step two, have I mastered step one? And as God works me through step two or step three, is he preparing me for this? What's the future? What's the objective of these dynamics that are coming together? Why does Peter list this, this particular group of personal fruit, personal attributes that grow within a true Christ follower? And Peter begins with this righteousness that you've achieved. Not achieved, although we often think we had something to do with it. You've been granted. You've been given. You've been blessed with the righteousness of Christ as a born-again Christ follower. That's the beginning. That's a prerequisite. We can go no further in our pursuit of a fruitful life that matters, anyway, without redemption through faith. When I was going through my counseling degree, we, they often would talk about how you know, some would say you shouldn't even bother counseling someone who isn't a born-again Christian, who's not redeemed. They have a different mindset, a different heart, different priority. They're, they're, you're unable to counsel them biblically because they're from a different perspective. It's much easier, not easier, but it's much more fruitful to counsel somebody who's been born again. They view things differently. And I believe that to a large degree that's true. We are new in Christ. Our priorities are new. And if we're going to seek a fruitful life in Christ, we need to pay attention to these building blocks to that and how we get to that point of godliness. Knowing Paul has laid, or I'm sorry, Peter's laid this foundation of righteousness, salvation, being redeemed is step one. Verse two, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Peter is praying for grace and peace because it's available to us as born again Christ followers like it is to no one else. We can rest in that knowledge. There's much persecution going on during this, during, in Peter's life and to the churches that were being written, but he's praying for grace and peace because it's available to you. It's fruit of you being a holy child of God. The knowledge which leads to our redemption bears fruit for our benefit. If we could wipe away everything in our lives except for two things, I'll just speak for myself, I would want to hold on to grace and peace. If I have those two things, what, everything else in life really doesn't matter. It's all, it's all in the Lord's hands. I'm not to complain. I'm not to be bitter or angry about how God directs my life. If I can hold on to grace and peace, that's my anchor. That's the fruit of being a child of God. Peter wants it to be multiplied among the church through the knowledge 
through the pursuit of God. Verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Now, this life is not worldly human life. You see people, you hear bumper stickers, you, you look at bumper stickers, you hear people talk about, man, I'm just trying to get through this life. I just want to be happy. You know, I don't know when my last day is, but I, I just all I care about is getting through this life. It's kind of a dismal point of view if you remain without Christ. But Peter says he has granted to us everything pertaining to life, spiritual life, eternal life. It's fruitful life in Christ. And there's no comparison between the life that Peter is talking about and comparing it to the human life, life before Christ. We are granted godliness. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Peter defines this as holiness, glory, and excellence. These are attributes of a holy God. And we are granted portions of that as we're adopted into the family of God. As he takes possession of us in a very real way, we are considered or granted holy. We can recognize his excellence, his glory. Verse 4, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine, of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. When we talked about purity, we talked about separating ourselves from our old corruption, our old sinful ways, our old desires. Being new in Christ means being new in every possible dynamic. But that takes development, and it takes our discipline to continue to separate ourselves from our old self. Because we have been granted, Peter says, his precious and magnificent promises. So by those promises, we can be partakers of this divine nature. God rescues us from being corrupt, impure, and unholy and makes us partakers of the holy and pure divine nature. The great weight of humility that this fact should bring upon us should just literally drive us to our knees. The fact that God would do this for us. And if we're not humbled by the fact that he has allowed us to be partakers, we're not getting it. We're not understanding how holy he is or how corrupt we are, that the Lord would reach down, condescend, pull us up to join him, not only in forgiveness and salvation, he says, I want more for you. You're mine. And you'll be partakers in this divine nature. Now this doesn't mean we develop a God complex. It's with humility we understand this great promise. The Greek word used for partakers may be familiar to you. It's koinonia. It's a form of koinonia, meaning fellowship. We Baptists love to fellowship, usually around food. <clears throat> but sometimes... It may not actually be true koinonia that we're experiencing. To be true koinonia, it must be lasting companionship. That puts fellowship in a different light, doesn't it? When we think fellowship, we think there's going to be a meal after church that's going to last about an hour and a half and we're going to have fellowship. Or we're going to have koinonia. That's possibly true, but it's not necessarily true. Because koinonia means lasting 
companionship. It is Christ-honoring fellowship that is generous and edifying to one another. That really kind of brings the word koinonia into focus. This idea of fellowship is more than just spending some time together. Now, think of lasting companionship, generous and edifying to one another, honoring Christ. This is what we partake of. This is the, the understanding or the element of that divine nature that the Lord's saying, I'm bringing, this, I'm bringing you into this. I want you to fellowship. I want you to koinonia with the divine nature, lasting companionship. I'm going to share with you. I'm going to be generous. It's going to be God-honoring. But out of all those definitions, I like the word lasting companionship. That's quite a difference than just, well, I'm saved. Got my fire insurance. I'm good. I can move on with the life I had before just in case this whole rapture and eternity and hell, if that's true, I, I want to proclaim faith in Christ. But nothing happens. Nothing changes. When we put our life under the magnifying glass, do we see that we are partakers in the divine nature? Sometimes it's hard to find. It's actually kind of a definition of sanctification. We have true koinonia with the divine nature because we departed the corruption of the world and our old self. We've made a move. I'm not that anymore. I'm this. I'm an adopted child of God. I've been granted holiness. I'm now participating, partaking in lasting companionship with my Lord and Savior. I mentioned a couple weeks ago how exhilarating it is to understand and see God working and this is no different when we meditate and examine the new relationship you have with Christ and the purpose and the fruit that it will bear when we see things his way and do that homework that we need to do to fully understand what the Lord expects of us. Verse 5. Now for this very reason, what was the reason? Sanctification. We're now partakers of the divine nature. It's done. The adoption is final. We've been proclaimed holy children of God. It's complete. So, Peter says, for this very reason applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, purity, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. Peter establishes, he first establishes our position as born-again Christians, true born-again Christians, as godly, as godly natured and holy. He's painted a picture, he said, this is where you are, folks. If you claim to be a Christ follower and you're redeemed, this is your current condition. And now I'm challenging you, I'm commanding you by his authority to apply all diligence to these steps. And he begins with faith. We trust in Christ. It's the cornerstone, it's the foundation. He's saying, this is where you start. You start with your faith. And then supply. Who does the supplying? You and I. We begin making those changes, those choices in our lives where we're supplying moral excellence into this new life with Christ. And this is where Peter begins describing this, this ladder of developing characteristics. 
found in true believers. He says, faith has saved you so that you will practice purity, this moral excellence. Because, as a redeemed child, you are able to do this diligently. I'm trying to piece these, the truths of these verses together so we recognize how connected they are. Faith has saved you so that, here's the expectation, you will practice moral excellence because, as a redeemed child, you are able to do this, and you are able to do it diligently. We have a great responsibility as we go through these verses. And Peter is challenging, saying, this is, these are the expectations. As we practice moral excellence, we gain knowledge because corruption is purged out and discernment is brought in. We learn to prefer holiness. Verse 6, and in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. We're not picking the ones we like. He says, you can't do this until this has been accomplished. When you do this, it will develop this. As you develop this desire for holiness, self-control becomes a priority for you, and developing self-control takes what? Perseverance. Perseverance is that self-examining, strenuous, humbling, gutted-out labor of constantly relying on God and this results ultimately in godliness. This is the promise. This is what Peter, the paint, or the painting that, uh, that that Peter is painting for us. So that we can manifest that godliness towards others. It doesn't stop at oh, good, I've done all these things, I've achieved godliness, now I'm done. Verse 7, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. These grow out of that godliness that we've worked so hard to achieve as we work up this ladder of characteristics of a born-again Christ follower. And here... We thought, oh, I can show kindness and brotherly love without all those other things. Those other things are too hard. Self-control, perseverance, prayer, moral excellence, that's hard. I'll just be nice to people. I'll just be kind and, and do what Jesus would do. And can I just skip all that other stuff? To show the kind of love and kindness that is of a divine nature... It takes the diligent practice of faith, moral excellence, gaining knowledge, self-control, perseverance, and ultimately, godliness. The Lord puts a very high standard on what he considers love and brotherly kindness. It's not what the world sees. He wants us to go through all of these other things, this purging and maturing process, so that we can get to the point where we are seriously participating and experiencing this divine nature, and it's changing us from self-centered to other-centered, and we begin to love others as God loves them. We can't do that on our own, and it's not what comes first. It's what, what comes last. Verse 8, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, he sets the bar even higher. Oh yeah, I do all those things. Are they increasing? Are you getting better at it? Are you becoming better at self-control? Are you persevering longer and in more difficult situations? Do you continue to strive for moral excellence? 
Is this something that you're, it's increasing, becoming greater of greater importance in your life? If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful. And this is where we want to be. I sure hope that's true about all of us. Nobody wants to be thought of as useless in any context. Certainly not unfruitful. He says, if these qualities are yours, they need to be in place first. And are increasing, you need to be growing in these qualities. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind and short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Peter is saying, if you lack in these qualities, or even a desire to pursue them, you've forgotten that you've been saved. And I'll add, if you've been saved at all. Because the characteristics of, of new life in Christ is this desire, and it's difficult, and we need to develop it and pursue it, but it's there. If you're saying the, the, the prayer of uh, salvation because you think it's going to keep you from hell, but there's zero change in your life, you need to re-examine that. You need to go to someone who can help you work through that process. Because at the minimum, we should have that desire to, to recognize, I want to be useful and fruitful for Christ. How do I do that? How do I get there? It's not by comparing ourselves to the other fruit trees. It's pursuing the purpose that God has for you. And that is also exhilarating to me to know that there's a, a specific purpose for my life and for your life. That should give us great encouragement and great desire to say, I want to find that, I want to develop it. We mustn't be content and comfortable where we are. We are to diligently pursue godliness in order to be fruitful. How useful are you to God? How useful am I? All I can tell you about myself is sometimes I'm fearful of the thought of giving an account of my usefulness and fruitfulness to God. I know God will be gracious and merciful, but will I regret my lack of diligence? Will I make excuses? Or will I say as Job did, behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. A fruitful life is to stand before God and boldly say, as Paul did, I fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. The mercy, the grace that you've shown us. Lord, as we reflect on this text uh, in just a moment, I pray that you would help us to let it sink in. Help us to realize that these are connected. Help us to realize that we, we have much work to do in our own hearts and our own minds. That we can't just reach out and try to pick the easy fruit, but to labor for a harvest in our own hearts and our own minds. Help us never to forget the privilege of being granted holiness and righteousness because you've promised that as we've exercised our faith. Lord, I, help, I pray that you'd help each one of us to be diligent, to apply all diligence to these areas in our life so ultimately we can please you to be godly and to love others as you do, to show true unconditional love and sacrifice. In Jesus' name.